What's up, fight fans? Welcome to the Zapata Brand Podcast, Boxing and Bagels Edition, brought to you by Ringside. Go to ringside.com forward slash podcast, and you two can get upwards of 40% off selected brands. Well, look who's back. My man, mm-hmm. Kevin Ioli from kevinioli.com mm-hmm. and the unbelievably charging to the top, the Kevin Ioli YouTube channel. Kevin, how are you? I am very good. Uh, good to see you, George. Thanks for everything. Well, yeah, I'll tell you, I, I said that uh, in the opening because your YouTube channel is going absolutely nuts with these interviews. Um, and, and they're all relevant right when they happen. Uh, give us a little rundown on what, what you've been what you've been up to with that channel. Well, you know, uh, I am trying to make it uh, one of the must uh, go to stops for boxing and MMA fans. You know, that's kind of my my goal. And so I, I have been doing this all along, even when I was at Yahoo Sports, talking to the top people in the sport, you know, the people who were in the main events of the fights and the and the big time, you know, peep trainers and promoters and Hall of Famers and whatnot. Um But since I've been on my own, and especially in the last maybe, I've been on my own now, what, uh, eight months, you know, in the last maybe three months, you know, I made more of a commitment to really kind of upgrading my YouTube channel. You know, I know my interviews were good before, but the production value, you know, was off. So now we worked a lot um, on improving the production value to try to get that. And it's certainly still not like I'm, I'm an individual person and, you know, and, you know, you know, as well as anybody, because you and I have talked about this, the, the problems that come up. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy with where I'm at in uh, on my page. And I think it's only going to get better from here. But like, so UFC 307 is next week. So I've interviewed so far Kayla Harrison, who's fighting uh, Ketlin Vieira on the card. Mm-hmm. I've interviewed former champion Juliana Pena, who is fighting uh, Raquel Pennington. I interviewed Raquel Pennington. I interviewed Alex uh, Pajeda. That interview is only up in a short form. That will be up fully uh, tomorrow. Um, I have Dana White coming up on Tuesday, so there's a plug for that. So uh, you can check that uh, sometime Tuesday afternoon. And and then I kind of had an interesting one um, that uh, I was – because you and uh, our friend Fred Sternberg, both of you guys mentioned to me one day last week, hey, are you going to watch this Mr. McMahon documentary on uh, Vince mm-hmm. McMahon? Now, I'm going to mention to you, George, I didn't even know the documentary was being made, right? I didn't even know. I knew nothing about it. I, I used to follow wrestling religiously. I don't anymore. And um, so I, I didn't know. So when you mentioned it to me and Fred Sternberg mentioned, I said, yeah, let me let me look at it. So I turn it on. I watch episode one and I see the credits roll. And all of a sudden the producers listed as Matt Maxson. And Matt Maxson was a uh, student journalist at UNLV. And he worked at the Apple Store. And at one period at the Apple Store in Las Vegas, I had a part-time job there. And they had me train the new employees. That was one of my jobs. And Matt Maxim was one of the people I trained. I and know. then out, as I trained him to work there, I find out he is a student journalist. So I became a mentor to him um, as he proceeded in his journalism career. He actually went on uh, to work at HBO for a while. So periodically I would see him because he'd be working on HBO boxing projects or sports documentaries and I would see him. But I haven't seen him much recently and then I see his name pop up. So I go and I text him and I say, hey buddy, congratulations on the doc. I hope you win uh, a lot of awards for this thing. And uh, do you want to do an interview? So we did an interview yesterday and that's up on my channel now. Um, what did what did he do at HBO Sports? He was he was working on documentaries in in okay. their production department. Yeah, so that was uh, kind of where he was he came from. Well, since we're since we're on it, what what did you think of the uh, Mr. McMahon docu series so far? So I watched um, <clears throat> four of the six now, and I think it's fantastic. Like I think it's a a really interesting portrait. Um, you know, I wouldn't say there's anything that I did not know about, especially in big picture, right? Um, and I haven't seen the last two episodes yet, but uh, like the Montreal Screwjob, of course, I heard about a lot, uh, but I didn't know the details of the Montreal Screwjob and, and the um, and the way they showed it in the, in the documentary. Right. But I, I thought it was fascinating and really, you know, captured uh, who Vince McMahon is. I saw he, you know, kind of was not thrilled about it. He put a statement out. Although his statement uh, that he put out came out before the actual final release version was out. A uh, quick question: Does he does he have any say in that documentary moving forward, or no? 
because I'd heard that he had tried to buy it. McMahon? No, no, yes. no, no. It's an editorial thing, so he has no say on it. None at all. None. Wow, that it's surprising he'd let something like that go because of how he is. It, it's surprising he let that go the way it was. This is this will probably be the first time anyone's had a documentary of someone like Vince without his approval on something. It it has to be one of the oh, so when it started, it was a collaboration between uh Bill Simmons uh and the ringer and and the WWE. And McMahon was still at the WWE at the time. Um now he left as this thing was being produced, right? But it was being produced by Bill Simmons' company as a documentary, not as you know something where the you know the WWE had creative control. The WWE could have done their own thing, right? They they have the resources to do that, mm -hmm. um, and they they certainly could have done that if they wanted. But they, um, they opted. And I'm a little surprised that they did this, you know, given, you know, given Vince's reputation and some of the things that have gone on over the years. Right. I knew Vince a little bit. And I mentioned this to Matt in my interview with him. Um, like the only the only uh, connection I had with him was in the first go round of the XFL when he owned it. Right. And mm -hmm. I was the only reporter in the league, at least for the whole season, who covered it as football. Like I remember um, the day before the first game. I was standing there and, and I was interviewing Dick Butkus and he was kind of like uh, one of the top executives for the XFL, you know, one of the hall of fame linebacker from Chicago bears. Great guy. I really enjoyed talking to him and Rick Goslin from the uh, Dallas morning news, you know, who was one of the top NFL writers, you know, he and I were there, but it was very quickly that everybody jumped off the bandwagon because, you know, the XFL in that first go round, um, wrestling fans thought it was too much football. Football fans thought it was too much wrestling, and nobody was into it. But I, rec at least in my opinion, right, I thought it was a good quality mm -hmm. football. Of course, it wasn't the NFL, right? But right. it was a good quality of football, and it was fun, right? And I was I was in Las Vegas, which where I am now still. And people were betting on it, and there was big crowds at the games, and you could hear, like, toward the end of games, like when a score or something would happen that would affect the point spread, the place would go nuts. <laughs> and you would hear that. Well, let me let me ask you: when you what, did you, you ever meet Vince McMahon himself personally? Oh, of course, yeah. You know, okay. Uh, you know, what, what was what was the aura with him? Because I met him one time, and there's only a few times where you're like, oh, geez, you know. I think meeting him. Uh, uh, Dana White wasn't like that for me for some reason. I kind of had a – it just seemed like he was a, a, a regular guy. But Vince McMahon was one of those guys where, you know, those one of those guys that you meet that you're like, holy cow. Like you with Ali. You say, oh, my God. This, this When I just remember the aura he had with him when he right. walked in and we were sitting there, it's just a different different feeling. What was your what was your thoughts when you first met him? Well, I, I, I met him on um, many occasions in the XFL, and then I met him one other time at a WWE um, – press conference for uh, WrestleMania nine, because I covered WrestleMania nine and that was before they broke kayfabe. Right. So um, right. It, they were, it was still, you know, pres you know, uh, presented as a, a real competition. Still um, real to me. Well, I'm still, sorry. Still real to me. <laughs> yes, no doubt. And, uh, I, you know, I thought he came across, you know, he was an intimate, he could be an intimidating guy. Right. But like, you know, for instance, I thought I said this to Matt in the documentary or my interview about the documentary. I thought Vince was really smart. Like he recognized early on. He didn't know me from Adam when I in the XFL days. But then he recognized that I was covering in his football. So I was his best ally in the media to talk to. So I was able to get a hold of him and, and the guy at the time that was the president, Basil DeVito, oh, wow. very easily, right? You know, very easily. And I was at the Las Vegas Review Journal, which, you know, at that time was, what was it, a 200,000, 150,000, 200,000 circulation paper, you know, not this like huge conglomerate like the New York Times. But he recognized I was an ally quickly because, you know, I was covering it as football. And I wasn't writing everything great, but I was covering it like football and not making fun of it like wrestling. And I thought that was very perceptive of him. And, okay. and that showed that uh, a side of him that, you know, maybe a lot of people wouldn't pick up on. Oh, good. Well, let's, uh, that's definitely something I'm going to finish watching. And I do have someone coming on this week from, uh, that's going to have something to do with that, uh, Mr. McMahon interview. Yes. I'll have, to, I'll tell you that one later on here. Um, but let's turn to the fights. This past weekend, um, a good fight I thought was real good. Uh, Sandy Ryan and Michaela Meyer. 
Now that was for the uh, Ryan's WBO welterweight championship. Um, I thought it, it was a back and forth fight, but I did think Meyer had an advantage. She was a little more technical than, than, than Ryan. Um, but definitely kind of a fight of the year. I could tell you that. Um, what did, what was your, what was your thoughts on that fight? I thought Ryan should have gotten the win. I had it six oh, really? rounds for, for Ryan. Yeah, I, I thought that in the second half of the fight, you know, they were landing very similarly, and Ryan's punches were the harder punches. You know, she kind of wobbled Mayer a couple times. And, you know, if you're landing the same amount of punches, the person who's hitting harder theoretically should win, you know, win the fight. And I thought she hurt Michaela a couple times. You know, not hurt her to the point – where she was in trouble of being out, but she wobbled her and, and gave her a little bit of, you know, some issues. So I, I was kind of, uh, I, okay. I thought Ryan won. To me, it was a 6-4, four, 5-5 five, five fight. Right. Well, I, I thought that the first six rounds were easily won by Meyer. I, I thought. I, I didn't, I thought they were won by Meyer pretty convincingly. I thought, uh, Ryan, uh, not, I mean, Meyer, she couldn't catch up with, with uh, I thought Ryan couldn't catch up with Michaela. Let me put it that way. The names are so close. Um, and I thought she she outboxed her very well, hitting a lot. And then towards the end, yes, but I think it was too little, too too late for for her. See you, buddy. I thought I thought that, to be honest with you that um, the you know Meyer won the first two rounds, and then I thought that um, uh, they kind of started splitting. Right? I I I don't I have my scorecard right in front of me, but I thought Ryan won three and four, as I remember correctly, to kind of get back into the fight. But uh, it, it was a close fight. Like, you know, the fact that Michaela won, like, I disagreed. But it was not like this. Oh, this is the horrible, the worst decision ever. No. I mean, you know, people are always quick to say fix. And, you know, they, they, the judges are whatever. You know, I kind of felt like that's a fight that could have gone either way. Um, you know, in my view, lean toward Meyer. I mean, lean toward uh, Ryan. But, you know, Meyer got the decision, no argument. Okay, well, and, and, and uh, I'm sure a rematch will be, you know, definitely in the books on that one. Def definitely down the road for that. Who knows with the, with the bad blood between them, with the paint and everything. That was a bit. That what? Yeah, you know, what the hell happened with that? I know. I know that there was an issue with the trainers. Someone had someone. Um, I believe Ryan had jumped into one of their camps, and then the trainer kind of stuck with, with with one of the fighters. It was with uh, Ryan. Yeah, so, what, so what happened was this, George. Uh, Michaela had been trained uh, her whole career by Al Mitchell, who was in her corner. Oh, yeah. on the, he was the 96 Olympic coach. And yep. then um, Kay Karoma, who was the 2016 Olympic coach. Um, so those were uh, Michaela's two, uh, or was one of the Olympic coaches. He was an assistant coach in the Olympics mm -hmm. that year. Uh, Billy Walsh was the uh, head coach. Um so the, those were the two coaches. She was fighting at lightweight. So uh, Ryan decides she's going to move um, to the U.S. and train under Coach K. And uh, Mayer heard about it and was not happy. And um, she then moved up to welterweight. So now she's in the same division. So uh, Karoma says, I will get Flick Savoy to train her and I will train you. So Flick Savoy was another trainer in the gym, just kind of like, you know, if you go to wild card, you have Freddie Roach, but you also have Marvin Samodio, right? There's right. more than one trainer there. Michaela did not like that. And she felt like, you know, that's, you know, you have to pick one or the other. So Michaela pulled away. So Michaela stayed with Al Mitchell and she added Kofi Jantua oh. uh, and then the former Olympian himself. And then, um, and Sandy Ryan then ended up with uh, Flick Savoy and, and Coach K. But interestingly, during the fight, Coach K went and sat up in the stands. Uh, yeah, they did uh, pan to him a, a few times there. But um, that happens more than a, a lot, uh, more than you think in the world of boxing. This The girl moving there to actually train with him, that doesn't happen at all. But trainers, they jump, uh, fighters jump from trainers, and there's a, it can lead to bad blood between them. This one was particularly bad because it was spilled outside of just the boxing realm. Did they ever find out what happened with that paint incident? No, there's nothing right now that I know of. So, I mean, it was terrible. You know, of course, Ryan thought it was Mayor or Mayor's team that was behind it. You know, I, I, I don't profess to know uh, Michaela Mayer well enough to, but, but my experiences with her, I don't believe that's the kind of person she is. I know her manager, George Ruiz, that's not the kind of person that George is. Um, mm -hmm. And so I don't, you know, 
until I know more, George, I'm going to chalk it up as just a random occurrence. And it just, it could have been anybody could have been you or me on the street. It just happened to be uh, Sandy at that time that got it. And, you know, it it was terrible, but, you know, until there's evidence that points at uh, mayor or mayor's team, you know, it, I, I'm going to just, you know, chalk it up to something random, bizarrely that happened in New York. I mean, there's cameras everywhere. You would think they they have some sort of film uh, of that happening. Yeah. The person, apparently the person pulled their car over threw the paint on her and got in the car and, and, and uh, drove away. So you got to think that they're going to pick up that camera, right? So yeah, uh, I'm somebody. sure the police are, are investigating that. And also on that car, on a car, the undercard there, uh, Xander Zayas, uh, probably the, the most touted Puerto Rican fighter coming up now, him and Callum Walsh, the 160-pound fighters there that are 58-pounders that are going to fight at some 54. point possible. Are they, are they 54? Yeah. Are they really? I thought he was 54. I think super yeah. Wow, that's oh, that's even better for us now. So at fifty four, Xander uh, Zayas seems to me to be the guy that the Puerto Rican fans are are pushing as the next quote unquote Trinidad, um, you know, Cotto type of fighter. Uh, what did you see about him? I wasn't that impressed with his showing, although I do think he has an immense talent. I wasn't that impressed with his showing. What did what did you think? I, I kind of feel. A little bit uh, on both sides, George. So, number one, I mean, he, you know, he's fighting Damian Sosa. Sosa is a pressure fighter, a guy that gets in your face, makes you uncomfortable. <clears throat> and what what did Xander Zayas do? He kept uh, Sosa at the end of his jab. Sosa didn't want to pressure because he was getting whacked whenever he tried to pressure. So that told me that hey, this guy was throwing good combinations back, and he had a hard jab. Um, But, yeah, I I didn't think that it was Xander's best performance. I think the last maybe three, four fights that, you know, he you know, he kind of was on this thing. And I think he's kind of leveled on now. Now, I think for him to get to where we believe he's got to go, he's got to go back up again. Right. He has to take that step up. And I think that happens. You know, um, they might have been a little bit too slow in moving him. And I think sometimes guys get comfortable. Right. And I don't know this for sure, but I'm just like from what I'm seeing on the outside, you know, he's like he's comfortable to win these fights. One twenty, you know, to one oh eight or one hundred to ninety and, you know, dominate the rounds and, and, and win going away, but not finish. And I, I think, you know, that Xander is good enough that he could have finished Damian Sosa. I thought Sosa was a good test for him. But I thought Xander was good enough that if he put everything together, he could have finished that fight. Yeah, um, the fact that he didn't tells me that maybe, you know, he's just kind of comfortable with that level he's at. But I think, you know, hearing some criticism and, and his trainer in the gym is going to probably talk to him. And I think you'll see him, you know, uh, take a step up next time out. This reminds me of the rise of uh, Phyllis Trinidad only because how young he is and coming up and touted. But then until Trinidad fought, uh, Maurice Blocker, I think it was Maurice Blocker when he knocked him out. That's when he really started to to to, to ascend to greater heights. Not saying he's ready for a championship fight now, but he definitely, I think, has to take a step up from a Sosa. Oh, yeah. From a Sosa, which... I agree with that. I mean, now remember Maurice Blocker, you know, was a former world champion when they fought, and mm-hmm. and and uh, but Trinidad also, like people forget, like you know, I love Tito, right? We became really close friends. I covered him. Uh, and the De La Hoya uh, Trinidad fight, my colleague uh, at the time, uh, Roy Fior, had uh, took Oscar. I took Trinidad. Of course, number one, he's speaking uh, uh, Spanish, and I don't speak <laughs> Spanish. And and then his father wasn't letting him talk, and I had to write every day for you know three weeks on this guy. But still, we managed to you know overcome that. And and Tito was a good guy. But what people forget about Tito was in those early fights is on his way up, he was getting knocked down a lot, right? Right. He would drop by guys, then he would get up and he would finish, right? So there was criticism. Oh, is Tito, you know. So I, I don't think it's unusual for young mm-hmm. fighters uh to have, you know, kind of blips in the road. It's not always linear, you know, down to up. You know, I mean it's if you look at it over time, it's like the stock market, right? You go from here to here, but in between there's a little bit of this, right? <laughs> and I think that that's kind of what we had uh uh, we, with Tito and what we're seeing now with both Callum Walsh and Xander Zayas. Well, speaking of uh, uh, Callum and Zayas, that seems to be the fight that everyone's pointing to that could be the next quote unquote uh, prospect fight. Um, or what are your thoughts on that? Um, 
coming from perspective of this could actually be one of those that catapults both because because they're both very talented uh, athletes. However, I think one is a little more skilled than the other, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I, I think I have been pushing both uh, um, Dana White, who uh, Tom Loeffler, who have Callum Walsh, and uh, Todd DeBuff, um, <clears throat> who and Bob Arum, who have Sandra Sias, to you know put those two together because you rarely see that two young prospects who are highly regarded. You know, people think are going to be stars. People think are going to be you know big influential players in the business. You rarely see that, George, where they fight when they're prospects. They usually wait until later. But I always say you can always fight again, right? There's nothing to stop, you know, and it's a rivalry. And so let's see where they're at. Like, I think Xander is ahead of Callum right now. Now, I, I'll say this. Callum fought, what, you know, a week earlier. Mm -hmm. Callum's fight, I thought he made a step up. He had been kind of like, you know, in fact, I said to Dana, yeah, I'm not that impressed with. Callum in his last couple of fights. And then I thought against Ronowski, you know, we saw him take a step up. Xander had been more impressive. And now, as we just denoted, he's kind of, you know, flatlining a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking like, uh, you know, they're both prospects. If I had a bet, if they fought in their next fight, I would bet Xander Zayas. Um, but uh, I think, you know, it'd be interesting to see them fight. And I like to see guys like that tested. And it tells a lot about them how, a, if they take the fight, like what their belief in themselves is and what their competitive spirit is, and you like to see that. Right. And then number two, you, you love to see, you know, hey, how, you know, can they rise to a challenge? Can Callum Walsh, you know, he has less pro experience than Xander. He's older, but less pro experience. Can he, you know, can he step up and, and show, hey, look, you know, I, I can compete with a fighter at this level. Let me ask you this. Uh, for, have you, do you recall – a time where you had two prospects coming up like that, meeting each other. I'm, I'm trying to think back and it had to be in the Don King, Bob Aram era somewhere where there were. Yeah, there there was, I mean, well, uh, Julio Diaz and, uh, and Floyd Mayweather, right. That they were right, both, correct. you know, now, uh, you know, to me, like there was no comparison between them. I, um, I didn't think so either. No, I didn't think so either. I remember Dan Raphael uh, was like really pushing for that fight. And I'm like, Mayweather's going to destroy him. Like what, you know, why are we, but that fight happened. And we and we saw what happened, and maybe to a lesser degree, Mayweather and Diego Corrales, right? Yeah, I, you know, all I would I could think of, you know, that was point. that was when both of them were prospects, and you know, but yeah, I I don't know that we've had like prospects at this, you know, I I was gonna say elite level, and now I decided to back off because neither <laughs> Callum nor Xander has proven to be elite yet. I think they're very good prospects. But for me to rate them elite, they got to take another step up, and they're not quite there yet. Yeah, elite would be like Trinidad De La Hoya at the t at the peak there when they fought. Uh, they're both undefeated. Both, you know. Oh, were they what, was were they both undefeated? Or did De La Hoya lose to Mosley before that? No, no. De La Hoya's first loss was to Trinidad. Trinidad they were, that's right. They were both at the, the fight that was called the fight of the millennium. And the big yeah. thing about that fight at the time was the fact that they were both undefeated champions. They both had world champions, so it was. Two undefeated world champions, kind of like Ali and Frazier, you know, many years before these two came and, and they fought. So that was Oscar's first loss, which I'm not, you know, you know, you know how I feel about Oscar, but I'm not sure that was really a loss. No, no. And I, and I love Tito Trinidad, but he lost that fight. I mean, I mean, I know it wasn't on paper, but uh, Trinidad, Trinidad lost that fight. I don't even think it was. I, I think maybe maybe the last few rounds that he lost because he he ran away. But I mean, he out he beat the daylights out of him for a good eight rounds there, a good eight. So you'd have to really come back to to sweep those. I couldn't even see how it was possible. Well, we know we know for sure that Trinidad won the last four, right? So yeah, you're starting right there, you're, he's up four zero. So now it's like he's got to win three of the first eight, and that's the the question. Like I thought Oscar won the fight, but it, it was close, right? I mean, because of of the nonsense that uh, that he did, and and it, that was just Oscar, you know, listening to a coach to a, you know, I, I think Bill Clancy, uh, Clancy, who was one of the great trainers of all time, one of the great boxing minds of all time. I think he made a massive mistake in that fight. He overestimated uh, Trinidad's power. Well, Trinidad had tremendous power, but he overestimated Trinidad's power and underestimated Oscar's boxing ability and toughness. Right, Oscar mm -hmm. was a freaking off guy right yeah 
Um, and uh, I think Gil made a mistake. And uh, if he had it to do over again, he wouldn't have given that advice. He might have said, be careful, be smart, you know, but basically, you know, he said, you know, don't engage with him. And Oscar decides to run the last four rounds. Okay. Wor worst, worst corner man decision. Now they're both passed. So you can, so you can go ahead. Was it Gil Clancy or was it Lou Duva telling Melter Taylor to battle it out with Julio Cesar Chavez in the last <laughs> round? Who do you, who do you go? Who do you go with on that one? Well, I, because it was so long, right? I'm going to say uh, uh, Gil Clancy's, right? And I and I love Lou and I love Gil, right? But I'm going to say uh, Gil's was the wrong, uh, worst one because it was for a third of the fight. Yeah, right? you know, it wasn't like he said in the twelfth round. Okay, you're way up. Run from him and don't you know don't engage because we know you won the first ten of the first eleven rounds. Mm -hmm. He said, run the final third of the fight. <laughs> And yeah, so that, Lou, Lou basically was taking the stance a lot of boxers you got to close a lot of trainers do, which I agree with. You have to close strong. Yeah, he said he needed this run. I, I vividly remember that I was watching it because Lou Du is a Jersey guy, and he would go to all the amateur shows. What a and great he, guy he, he was. Oh, he was really he was really good. He was really good. One of actually one of my first autographs is Lou Duva. How about and, that? Uh, yeah, and he was like, "You gotta win this last round," and that's why I was like. He's way ahead, I thought. And little did we know, it was cl closer than we thought. But I said, he's way ahead on this fight. I got to give you my Lou Duva story with the Tyson uh, Holyfield fight. So, so um, Holyfield fought Bobby Chez, and you know, the people thought he had a heart problem. He looked bad against Bobby Chez. Tyson knocks out Bruce Seldon, and now they, they announced the fight uh, for uh, November of 96, Holyfield versus Tyson. November 8th. What's that? I think it was November 8th. November 8th, was it? Yep, and 96 was at the MGM Grand. I was there at that fight. And what, what I remember was, you know, when the fight was made, I'm like, oh, man, Tyson's going to, you know, uh, destroy uh, Holyfield. But then, just like we did on a lot of the big fights, Royce uh, Fuhr and I, who was my colleague at the Review Journal, he took Tyson, I took Holyfield. And so we're covering them. And so now I'm around, I'm talking to Lou, and he's like, believe me, Holyfield's going to win this fight. And then fight week, I was next to Holyfield side. If you look at pictures during fight week, I'm in all those pictures because I'm like either right next to Evander or like in that in that group shot. And I started hearing Evander's, you know, confidence. And all of a sudden you start going, you know, maybe. And then you hear the stories about when they were teenagers and they sparred and Holyfield, you know, beat the crap out of my lose like Lou bet. Um, I want to say it was uh, twenty five thousand on uh, on uh, Evander at twenty four to one. Oh my God! Are you shitting me? You no, know, and that was a big. He said to me, he showed me his ticket because I was one that reported that, right? And then he later talked about it to everybody. But he he showed me his ticket. He goes, "This is how much I believe in Evander." Wow, that's you talk about going out on a limb. That's a huge payout, though. Holy crap! That was like a million. That he made something like that. Yeah. That is crazy that he's that confident in Holyfield. But then again, if we look back and st take back, step back, and, and uh, hindsight's always twenty twenty. That was actually a better bet. Tyson, with all the stuff going outside the ring, um, a talent. I mean, unbelievably a great fighter. I think Holyfield was just that good. Holyfield that was good. a better fighter, right? Let, yeah. Let's be honest. Like you yeah. know, uh, Holyfield was a better fighter than Tyson, but Tyson was a bigger personality and remained so. Right? I mean, Tyson. I mean, Jake Paul did not call out Holyfield to, and, and <laughs> Netflix didn't put it on, you know, like that that whole thing. Like Mike Tyson is an iconic figure in our culture, not mm -hmm. just in boxing, but in our, you know, our uh, pop culture. Holyfield is an iconic figure in the boxing culture, but he's certainly not an iconic figure in the pop culture like Mike Tyson is. Well, uh, he and he only got to that level after the uh, bite fight, you know, where he really – you know, because Holyfield was just, you know, regular guys. What Just because he was the heavyweight champ of the world, people knew him. Don't get me wrong. But that bite fight really, you know, made his his stock rise, too. Uh, Holy well, I, thought, I thought the first fight, you know, I mean, well, first of all, he was in the fan man fight, right? And you go back and Holyfield, Hol, Holyfield's career was very notable. You know, he, he fought in the Olympics and he kind of got screwed now against Kevin Barry, right? Who became yeah. a friend of mine, the... Trainer, the highly regarded trainer Kevin Barry was a light heavyweight for New Zealand in the Olympics, and Holyfield ends up uh, losing to him. So he ends up with a bronze medal instead of a gold, like people thought he would win. Then, um, you know, Holyfield becomes the fastest to uh, unify and become undisputed cruiserweight champion. Then, after Buster Douglas beats Tyson, who's Buster Douglas's first fight against? 
Holyfield. Holyfield beats George Foreman. Um, you know, he Holyfield did you look at his body of work and he fought everybody, he did everything. So when he got to that first Tyson fight, a lot, you know, people were kind of misled. They saw Tyson, you know, Bruce Seldon was afraid. Oh god. <laughs> Peter, Peter McNeely should never have been in the fight, right? I mean, they gave they gave Mike, uh, it was his first fight back out of prison. They didn't know where he was. Peter McNeely had no business being in that, you know, in that ring. With well, Mike. You, Mike had these easy fights that he took. Holyfield looked bad against Bobby Ches, and there was rumor that he had a heart problem. So people said, oh, he's done. He can't beat Mike Tyson. And they got and how wrong you are. And it just shows how little people know about boxing. Well, I'll tell you, Peter McNeely really moved up the rankings there for the WBC. <laughs> yes. Yeah. The heart, he was, that night at the press conference when Tyson fought McNeely, there were a lot of people outside. So they have these sliding walls, like and they can make one ball, you know, two ballrooms into one big ballroom or, you know, however many it is. Right. And um, people, security couldn't keep everybody out. So a lot of these people. People that were just fans got into the press conference. So some guys asking a question who was, you know, just a fan, and and McNeely like, "Are you press? Are you press?" You know, and he's yelling at him, oh and you God. see the wall shaking because the people <laughs> on the other side of the wall, you're going, "What is going to happen here?" Like it was nuts, you know. Yeah, that 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 was the good old days, the good old days of boxing. Oh, but I, I want to get real real quickly on, uh, before we wrap up. Um, and I want to go over what's coming up down the road. UFC left Paris last last night. Was it last night? Yeah, it was last night. What a knockout! Holy cow! Um, you sent that to me. Explain explain to to the audience exactly what happened there with that that vicious knockout, up, and so they can watch it themselves. Yeah, it was uh, Faris Zium uh, was fighting uh, Mad Travola, and you know the fight started out fairly even. Now they're in the third round, and as the fight went on, you know uh, Zium, uh, the French fighter. Who had a really loud backing by the crowd starts to take over um and you know he's he's clearly going to win the fight at the point that this knockout came uh but obviously he's trying to finish and you know for all is trying to get you know get a finish himself they were on the ground they get up and they clinch on the cage and you see zim he gets his right arm and he puts it on top of uh uh Frivola's head and he kind of pulls his head down at the same time he throws a knee and boom, and the knee hits right on the chin. Yeah. You saw Frivola literally like he was shot go down on his back. Now, you know, Zim landed one punch before yeah. the referee could get in and stop him, which that punch was not needed. Uh, I wish he had not done. Um, but he landed that punch. The referee threw him away. And then Frivola laid there for a while. I mean, that was one of the most brutal knockouts I have ever seen. Yeah, that you're you're right. That second punch, I I was shocked he threw it to begin with because he was out before he hit the canvas. He was out, yeah. and he had to know he was out. That was maybe it got his the adrenaline got the best of him, and he jumped on and nailed it. But hold, that that's how they're taught, right? So it's hard to pull back. But a lot of guys recognize when they land. Oof. Did you did you see the picture I posted of Moicano's shoulder? That is unbelievable. How how in the world? I I think I have a bad shoulder injury. Uh, that your it was that picture. Who was that picture from? Did, did uh, you... that was Moicano's X ray? Okay, Mark, no, but I'm saying who posted that because people are using your yeah, they're, they're using your your Twitter account uh, posting that, yeah, my and my Instagram, yes, and your Instagram one, yeah, they're showing that is a complete break. You saw and, and a complete could have been a compound fracture if it breaks the skin. If it breaks the skin, that's a compound fracture. Yeah. That is as vicious of a break I've, I've seen. I think I have a bad shoulder. That was really bad. How did he? How, did he even say what? What? How he felt? He, you know, he just said um, it, it sounds like he injured it beforehand and then exacerbated it in the fight because his, his only comment in the fight was, you know, he um, he, he reposted my uh, my. Yeah. Uh, for the x-ray and he said in the in the repost on instagram he goes i wasn't going to pull out of a main event no, no matter what and i had to go so you think about it like you know he had that dominant first round george and you know i don't know how the hell saint denis uh survived the first round yeah. <laughs> he managed to survive then in the second round you know you could tell it was almost like uh moicano took the second round off and maybe with a minute or 90 seconds to go, they were clinched on the cage. And I and he had him, you know, in, in a body lock. 
And I thought he was going to try to dump him to the uh, canvas. And you saw he kind of for a split second did this, and then he thought better of it, and he let him go. And in the high time, I'm like, I wonder why he didn't do it. Then you later think, well, that's because the shoulder, you right. know, was hurting him so much. Well, think about it. He fi he finishes the first round after the first round's over. So maybe just maybe the adrenaline gets him through the first round. He's got to sit. And that's when that pain would start to come in, you know, broken hand, something like that. But something like that. And then go back out two more rounds later to fight. That is, you talk about tough. I mean, I hope, I hope he gets taken care of for this uh, yes. from a bonus. I'm sure, they, I'm sure they took good care of him. Yeah, that, uh, that was crazy. That was a crazy, crazy thing. Well, Kev, coming up the next couple of weeks, what do we got going on in the boxing world and, and, and UFC? Well, uh, this week is UFC 307, so I will be in uh, Salt Lake City, Utah for that event. So that should uh, could be fun. And um, that will be my – Are you going to have boots on the ground there? Uh, I'm going to be, like, we'll be there. No, I'm, I'm, I'm actually doing video as, as – you know, video or trying to get – No, because I have most of my stuff done. I'm going to be here. I'm not going up till fight day, so I'm going to leave oh, Saturday okay. night. So it's a short flight to Utah, so I'm going to leave – you know, now that I work for myself and I got, I don't have a corporate budget, I got a Kevin Ioli budget. Uh, I got to be careful on mm -hmm. hotel nights and all that stuff. So I'm going to fly up uh, on Saturday morning. So I'll have contender series on Tuesday night. So I'll be over there. And I should say uh, I got on Tuesday. So uh, Tuesday, October 1st, I will be interviewing Dana White. And I will have that interview up that day. You know, one of the things I've been trying to do is, you know, you and I have talked about this at length is put shorts out of my interviews and mm -hmm. kind of tease them and then and then put the full interview out. But I think with Dana, I want to get the interview out right away. So we may put shorts out after the full interview is posted. Mm -hmm. So people just want to watch clips. But I'm going to get that full interview out with Dana. So as quickly as uh, as that interview is over, we're going to try to get it posted as quickly as possible so as many people can enjoy it uh, before the fight. And I'll ask Dana about getting into boxing uh, on that interview. Well, the thing is, uh, what people have to realize, too, is you have the, the, the relationship you have with Dana. You're the one who's going to ask him the tough questions if you have to. And 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 uh, I, I must say, you do get the credit for, for you know, really putting it to Dana what your opinions are and what you feel us as fans want to see. And that's why your interviews with Dana always come off as the best, in my opinion. Thank and uh, I'm not just saying that. I'm just, you know, giving you that, giving you my, giving my, you my two cents. You like, know, I'm close with Coach Diz, so you're saying that. Yeah, and I know his interviews with you have done phenomenal on our channel. <laughs> but the coach just has COVID right now, so he's he's home recovering. Yeah, you didn't mention that I was pinch hitting for Coach Diz today. I didn't. I should have. I should have. Yeah, right out of the gate. But he's uh he's he's struggling today. He he was okay the other day. He says it's really weird. One day he's fine. Next day he's bad. Next day he's fine. Then he's bad. It's it's uh. Well, let me ask you this then. So your 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 brother uh, Joe, who is nicknamed uh, Jersey Joe. Yeah. I mean, I understand he has connections with a ton of fighters, like what, a ton what of fighters it? in New Jersey. A lot a lot of Jersey fighters and trainers and stuff. Mostly UFC guys too. Um, a lot of uh, bodybuilders and stuff like that. Yeah, he does. Um, I mean, his channel is uh, straight out of Jersey. You can reach out to him on Instagram, on uh, Facebook. I don't think he's on Facebook, but Instagram and, and, and subscribe to his channel straight out of Jersey. I'm sure he could hook people up with st stuff like that. So maybe, 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 you know, if anyone's out there wants to interview him or get him hooked up with someone, Jersey Jay Z is the guy. There's the man. He's the man. Well, Kevin, uh, <laughs> Kevin Ioli from kevinioli.com and the still to be named YouTube channel. So we'll just go with Kevin Ioli, the YouTube channel. Uh, great content there coming up this week. Dana White on Tuesday. It'll be up there to watch it. And as always, like and subscribe to our channel as well. There's a Pot of Brand podcast straight out of Jersey and Kevin Ioli. Kevin, as always, buddy, thanks for thanks for pinching hitting. Oh, you got it, man. And congratulations on hitting 3,000 subscribers. That was awesome. 3,000 subscribers. I did, who would thought a dumb bagel guy could get 3,000 subscribers, have 3,000 yeah, people listening right. <laughs> All right, Kevin. We'll talk to you later. See you soon. See you, buddy. Thanks for watching the Zapata Brand Podcast. Please subscribe to the podcast and listen where all podcasts are available.